Welcome to the most listened to golf in the world, the Fairways of Life show, on air, online, and around the world, with the most candid interviews, unforgettable stories, taking you beyond the ropes. Here's your host, New York Times best-selling author, Matt Adams. Welcome into the Fairways of Life show, folks. Pleasure to have your company from wherever you are joining us around the world. As you can see, we're still here in our home away from home. I'm up at NBC Sports hosting Golf Central. Actually, today I'm going to do Golf Today at noontime Eastern and then Golf Central, which will be at 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. Eastern time up here. The noontime show will be with George Savarikas uh, joining us. And so looking forward to it. I love being up here. It's, it's getting warmer finally, but it's a great time of year to be uh, any place, really, when when you feel like you're on the verge of, well, we're right, right in the middle of the NCAA tournament, where we've got uh, college hockey is, is wrapping up right now, the NHL is marching towards the playoffs, baseball right around the store, around the corner and getting started uh, for the year in earnest as spring uh, season is still underway. There's just so much going on right now in in the world of sports congratulations to those in the world of golf that were able to etch victory in the week that was it was so much fun to see peter malnati win at the valspar championship peter is a dear friend of ours and has been for years he's such a good dude to see him break through and win for the second time on the pga tour after so many years was awesome. Nelly Corda winning in the playoff uh, it, and the, even Podrick Harrington winning on the PGA Tour champions. You know, he had two double bogeys in that round, but he finished with a flourish of birdies to etch his victory. His seventh, if memory serves me, on the PGA Tour champions for Podrick. But we are super, super excited about today's guests as we are joined by a face, a voice that you have come to know very, very well, although we will delve a little bit more into his life and his background. Frank Nabilo is joining us, a 14-time winner amongst the professional ranks. He won five times in what was then called the European Tour. He's also won on the PGA Tour. Uh, he was a teammate, a member of International President's Cup teams multiple times. All told, he played in 254 European Tour events, 172 on the PGA Tour side, 56 total top 10 finishes, which is incredible when you think about that. And he had plenty of those in major championships as well. Uh, he was appointed a companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit in 1998, which speaks to his character. Delighted to welcome Frank Nabilo to the show. And, and Frank, thank you so much for taking the time. I guess the first question I would have for you, just jump right in here, if I may, is your kid in New Zealand, you end up becoming a world-class golfer and now one of the faces and voices of the game. What were your early inspirations? Who did you look to in this game and go, you know what, that's a person that I think I'd like to aspire to be like? Well, Matt, uh, first of all, great to chat to you. Um, and you're going to lead with a, with a really hard question to start. Um, I, I have a vision, really, of the 1975 Masters, which to me is my favorite. But also as a kid in New Zealand, we used to get some of the big sporting events, whether it was Wimbledon or Augusta. And I know Augusta is just around the, uh, around the, around the door two weeks' time. Um, and in 1975, it was Jack Nicholas, Johnny Miller, and Tom Weiskopf. So I, I got to see you know, this great triumphant, three different styles of play and, uh, you know, along just a phenomenal golf course that, that everybody is sort of so uh, you know, aware of. And um, I just love the, the difference in styles of play. The, the, all three were really at the sort of peak of their careers. And um, oddly enough, too, you know, I got to work a little bit alongside Johnny, got to know him very, very well. Tom Weiskopf, the late Tom Weiskopf, sadly, is like a mentor to me, and obviously I've spent enough time with the great Jack Nicholas. So it was such a lasting impression. But you're right, New Zealand, it's so far away. So for me, the dream of ever living in America, let alone playing in America, it just seems so far away. But that was really the first uh, first fishing expedition into the great game of golf where I took it seriously and thought this would be phenomenal to be involved in. Were you surprised or did it come naturally to you that you were able to pick up the game and, and be so proficient at it? Um, that's a tough one. I, I guess when you're not exposed to it, none of my parents had played it. 
I had very, I had a low bar. I had, I had zero expectations. I hadn't seen enough great golf, you know, side by side with somebody. So for me, I was allowed to just experiment the first couple of years and just hit a ball. And, and actually, initially, it was on a beach, um, iron sand, which is like the black sand beaches. There was a, my, my parents uh, had a small beach house and there was a couple of golf clubs left there. So you could just swing away and hit. And then, you know, I, I played a lot of other sports. I played rugby league, which is not rugby, the ones that everybody talks about that New Zealand plays. I, I was a middle distance runner, basically any sport, love tennis. So by playing a lot of other sports, you improve your hand-eye coordination. And then I got into golf sort of seriously when I was 13, got on scratch, the old handicap system when I was 16. So it did develop very, very quickly. But once again, I was in a very, very small goldfish bowl in New Zealand. And then I was lucky enough to win the New Zealand Amateur on my 18th birthday. I was the second youngest or youngest ever to win it. So that's when I started to take the game seriously. And I was lucky also the era that I played in. Because I think if I was the same age, you know, in New Zealand right now, that jump to professional golf would just be so much bigger. And in those mm -hmm. days, the developmental tours, Australasia was an extremely good tour. Um, There's a lot of events. Asia was quite prominent, the Asia and the Japanese tour. And then, of course, the goal was then to go to Europe. And then if you were really, really good, then you went to America because that's the way everybody else went. David, the David Grahams of the world, the Greg Normans of the world, Baker Finch. You name it, anybody that came from our neck of the woods, that was the path that they traveled. In those early days, Frank, was, was golf for you an idle enjoyment, something just for fun to, to mix in with all of these other sports? Was it an escape <clears throat> from something else uh, or yeah. did you have higher aspirations? No, it was an escape, to be brutally honest, Matt. Uh, my parents were going through a divorce when I was 16. So with golf, one of the beauties of the game, it's played by such a diverse nature of people, male, female, young, old. But when I became a member of my first golf club was a golf course called Waitakere. It was a country club. And I don't mean, you know, $100,000 joining fees. This was like a hundred New Zealand dollars a year to join. And the members would pick me up on a Saturday. And obviously they were much older than me. So they would stay for a drink, for example. I couldn't, it's too young. So I'd go and, and basically hit balls or try and play holes when it was borderline dark. And then when it was time for them to take me back, they'd drop me off on the way home. And like I said, none of my parents played. And then, you know, divorce is never good. My, my daughter also went through the same thing. And um, so you need something that you can just, that consumes you. And golf did consume me. It, one day was always different from the next. You played in the morning, it was different than playing in the afternoon. The very, very same golf course, seven days in a row played differently every single day. So I, I love that, you know, the nuances of the game. I love that it was sort of calculating. There's a little bit more time before you got to hit the shot. So I realized there was an emotional part of it. Your mind had to be stronger. Um, you could hit a bad shot and how that would make you fritter away shots on the next few holes. So there was a lot of areas in my life that I had to shore up. And I was very, very fortunate that golf helped me do that. How cool was it? Frank, for you to realize that as you started to emerge on the global stage, that you also became, whether you meant to be or not, you became a representative of an ambassador, if you please, of New Zealand. Because back in those days, particularly as you were cruising through parts of the, the broad width of playing on the European tour and then coming to America, you're going to run into people that wouldn't even know, and I mean this respectfully, but they wouldn't even know where New Zealand mm. is. And here, you, yeah. and David, and Nick, and, and you've got these prominent players that are emerging from there where people had to scratch their head all of a sudden and go, where was it again you were from and, and what's it all about? And here we are these years later and we're talking about New Zealand. Once again, you're, you're promoting the virtues to the world. Yeah, I, that happened by accident. I, I can't take credit for that really, but but you're right. I, I was surprised because as a, as a kid in school, we learn about politics all over the world. We, we, we studied geography, we studied history in New Zealand. Uh, it, history doesn't compare to Britain, for example, or let alone America. So for us, we were, we knew where the, you know, the United States was and what North America was, what South America was, Asia or whatever. We knew where all the countries were. And so I was amazed where people would go, oh, you're from New Zealand, where's that? And I'm like, well, you know, don't you have a globe or a map? You know, you can figure it out, right? 
And everybody thinks it's, well, not everybody, but a lot of people think it's on the other side, on the uh, Western side. And I'm not great with geography, you know, with, with um, navigation, that's for sure. Uh, on the Western side of Australia. And so I, even now I have a lot of American friends that want to go down to New Zealand and they go, well, I'm going to go to Australia first. And then, well, we might extend our trip and go to New Zealand. And I said, well, if you fly down, do you realize you're going to go over New Zealand first? And they go, no, no, it's further away. And I go, no, it's not. So, yeah, that did surprise me. And then it's such a small country. For me, when I grew up, New Zealand was three, three and a half million people. It's nearly double that now. That was a big country. I think it was 1981. I'd never seen a city that big. And I was completely lost. And, and also, you would, you know, when I was a kid, you, lost, you would almost tap someone on the side of the side of the shoulder and go, you know, can you can you give me a loan? Things were different. And a, lot, a lot of it's here too. People didn't lock their homes. So it was great, great to grow up in an environment like that. And, and I've always said to friends where I live now, you know, travel is the best educator in life. You know, your show's called Fair Way of Life. You know, golf has taken me just about all over the world. There's a few places I still want to visit. But I've been fortunate enough to go to all the great golfing destinations and a lot of other ones that I'd want to visit as a tourist. And that's pretty neat, really, I guess, from a kid from New Zealand. When you think, Frank, of the, the emergence of the President's Cup, and I know detractors mm. will look at it and say, well, the United States is dominating the <laughs> President's Cup, and is there really a competition there, et cetera, to which, for me personally, I think, you know, pump the brakes for a second, let's let it continue to develop. When you look at the early years of the Ryder Cup, it was a spirited competition. It was about even, but immediately following the Second World War, again, the Americans dominated before the whole of Europe came in and it kind of balanced the scales once again. My personal feeling is, uh, Frank, that when it comes to the Ryder Cup, I think part of the motivation and success of the European Ryder Cup team has been this effort to prove to the mighty United States that, you know what, we're good players too, and we can compete and we can be as, mm. as good as you. It's kind of that underdog mentality. Uh, when it comes to the International President's Cup team, how much is that same kind of let me prove it to you mentality there, and what does that uh, to, uh, relay in terms of the future of the President's Cup? Well, um, excellent question. It's there's two ways of looking at the President's Cup. Obviously, the result is one of them. How important it is, and you referenced Europe. I remember Ken Ken Schofield when he led what was the European Tour then, and for him it was very important for validation of his players. And he was fortunate too that he had an era. I'm going to say what the, they were born in 1957, the Big Five. You had Biasteris, Faldo. Langer, Lal, and, uh, and Ian Wisdom. I was going to say, I nearly missed Wizzy. So you had five of the best players in the world. That's nearly half a team of 12. So they really wanted validation that they were, you know, they were already winning major championships. And they wanted a chance to prove that, uh, you know, that Europe, Europe was a big deal. So it wasn't just about validating the players, too. It was validating the tour. And remember, too, and just prior to that, there, there was two golf balls. People don't talk about that enough. And, and really, the, that generation of Biasteris, you know, Faldo and, and, and co were the first generation that really started to play most of their golf with the large ball. Some of the, the, the generation before would flip back between the small ball and the big ball. So equipment was getting standardized. And, and that's why I've always sort of spoken out with equipment, how equipment changes the way professional golf plays. As soon as there's an innovation, for example, metal woods, the game changes. As soon as you go from wound ball to solid ball, the game changes. It's going to benefit some other players. As soon as you, the advent of the 60 degree wedge, the utility club, the game goes through these changes. So the big ball, small ball really sort of gets pushed under the rug, but that was big for, for, uh, for international sides. Now, fast forward to the President's Cup, we didn't have the same um, challenges that, that the Europeans, or it was Great Britain and Ireland in those days. But we did have the challenges of, of actually not having one tour because remember, we include South Africa, who has its own tour. We include Asia and Australasia. So Australasia, New Zealanders and Australians were used to playing against each other. We were foes. South Africa is also you know, a great uh, rugby nation. So they were also sort of foes. And then Asia, we really didn't have a lot to do with at that particular part of time. 
So the hardest thing for the international side is trying to get some sort of commonality. But it was very important to validate those region, regions. So whether you were Jumbo Ozaki, for example, who was on our team early on, or a young Rio Ishikawa, it was very important for them to um, represent their region. Obviously, for me, from New Zealand, it was huge for New Zealand, for young New Zealand players to come through. Australia has always been very, very strong, as is South Africa in golf. So it was more about the knock-on effect of how it would benefit the game in those era, era, areas. But you're right, the, the, the winning tally is actually, well, to be brutally honest, is extremely poor. There have been very spirited challenges, certainly from the international point of view, but um, the results just haven't sort of stood out where it's going to make people watch and say, I've got to go to the President's Cup because it's, you know, it's like the Ryder Cup. It's not yet, not even close. Frank Nablo is our guest on this Fairways of Life show on this Monday. Delighted to have your company, folks. The Fairways of Life show is presented by the PGA Tour Superstore. They are the number one golf retailer from coast to coast. Yeah, because they're big, beautiful stores. But I think it's because of the beautiful people that work within them. You can shop with the pros at the PGA Tour Superstore and know that they have a vested interest in what is best for you and your game at your happy place. Uh, join us when we come back more with Frank Nabilo taking a look at the game, not only past, but where it stands right now and its potential future. Relax. Easy now. Find your happy place. It's all in the hips. Just tap it in. Yes! Find the latest clubs and apparel at Golf's Happy Place, the PGA Tour Superstore. In Ireland, golf is more than just a game. Come and experience our world-famous Lynx courses and our world-famous Parkland courses, all set alongside world-famous scenery and visit our world-famous historic sites. And while you're here, enjoy our world-famous hospitality. Fill your heart with Ireland at ireland.com forward slash golf. It screams. It tracks. It's soft. It reacts. It is the Bridgestone Tour B with a game-changing reactive cover designed to spring faster off your driver and stick longer to your wedges. Try Bridgestone's Tour Bs, the Tour Ball reinvented. The Gen 6 Iron is a culmination of everything that we have learned as a team. The absolute best golf club I've ever hit. It's something special. Say hello to the new PXG Gen 6 Iron. The longest, most accurate irons we've ever made. They go higher and farther than any iron that I have hit to date. And they're so easy to hit. Super excited for the consumer to try this. They're going to love them. PXG, nobody makes golf clubs the way we do, period. Baseball? Nah. Football? Done it. I think I'm going to go after the PGA Tour. Bo, you're going to need the right equipment company. I think I got that. You know Tour Edge backs all their clubs with a lifetime warranty. I know. They ship all their premium custom clubs in 48 hours. I know. All their premium clubs are hand-built in the USA. I know. You know Tour Edge has won 35 times out here. Guys, I know. Pound for pound, nothing comes close. Boeing Golf provides the ultimate world-class golf destination with 10 championship caliber courses spanning three resorts. Centered in Michigan's northern lower peninsula, the courses are the products of some of the game's masters, including Robert Trent Jones Sr., Arthur Hills, and Donald Ross. From the all-inclusive vacation packages, elite instruction with the Boeing Golf Academy, tournaments, and so much more, Boeing Golf truly offers an unrivaled Michigan golf vacation experience. Just log on to boeinggolf.com. Welcome back to the Fairways of Life show. Our guest is Frank Nabilo, one of the uh, more introspective thinkers in the game of golf. Love getting a chance to chat with him about all things going on in the world of golf. Frank, when you left the game, you left because of injury. Did you have a time when, when you had kind of a why me 
type of emotion with that? Was <laughs> was there a bridge for you to cross? A bridge. It was it was a Grand Canyon. Yeah, I was. I hit the lowest point of my life. I I I would wake up every day saying, "Why me?" I got diagnosed with inflammatory polyarthritis actually in my official rookie season um, in 97. So that was you know your first year. Uh, I'd already won two Sarazen World Opens. They were in Atlanta. They were like a precursor to the World Golf Championship event. So I thought my game would translate here. I'd won Greensboro, but um, three days in the Mayo said, this, this isn't going to last very long. So I, I tried to sort of eke it out another four or five seasons but um but yeah if you ask my wife i, I would have been a, a misery to to live with probably still she'd probably still say the same now but um but yeah yeah it was it was very much why me why me but i was lucky because the the very channel that we're on right now the golf channel is just down the road where i live it's like 15 20 minutes away and um after about a year on the couch uh, I, I was very very fortunate and i'm the first to admit that that i was given a, a second career so in the end, golf has given me everything in my life, whether it's uh, walking the fairway, trying to hit a, chase the little white ball or cover it with TV. So uh, after all these years, I consider myself very, very fortunate. It's, it, television's a funny thing, though, Frank, isn't it? Because the, mm. the presumption that most people have in watching what we do is that somehow you get trained where the reality is more that you kind of get thrown in the deep end and they see if you can swim. Uh, what was the transition like for you to go from player where you're used to answering the questions that you're asked to all of a sudden realizing, no, you know, I got to, I got to make sure there's a little more meat on the bone. <laughs> well, you can be a little diverse as well, but be, I, I love your analogy about the swim because I asked a very good friend of mine, uh, Renton Laidlaw at the time, I said, Renton, I'm thinking right. uh, Renton went from a, a, a very good rider to really the voice of, of, of golf in Europe there for a while. So I remember picking the phone up, ringing rent and, and then I said, can we meet when I'm in Europe next? So we chatted away and I said, I, I'm seriously thinking of TV, you know, like, please just tell me I'm being, being crazy. And he goes, no, like he said, if you ask people, they're going to tell you something different. Everybody's got a different way of how they solve the issue. And he said, oddly enough, he said, look, it's, it's like a swimming pool, except the differences in TV, you jump in the deep end. He said, if you can paddle around for a little while, you'll survive. I said, if you can't, then just get out and find another job. So as I, as I mentioned, Golf Channel, we're, we're early on in it. Um, they had a show called Live From, started up the very first year I was there. And we had two producers. Uh, one was Eric Saperstein, who I think you know. He works at Full Sail in Orlando to this day. And the other was Matt Hegarty. They were very, very diverse. Matt is still with the Golf Channel now and still produces Live From. But... Eric Saperstein was very buttoned up, very formatted, and Matt was the opposite. So along with Brannell, and uh, I'm trying to think who the first host was, whether it was Craig Can um, of, of Live From in those days before Rich. And so we could learn under a format, and therefore it was a very good learning curve. And then when the show was produced by Matt, Matt was very much sort of tell me what you're thinking about. So we could be sort of go off on your own tangent. And, and it was great to learn in those two environments. But deep down, I, I preferred live golf. I always did because, I guess, in some respects, I felt like it was unfinished business. Just to get out there and, and at least be a little closer to the game, the, the live version. I actually think it's, it's truer. So that's always really where I wanted to go. And I was lucky. I, my very, very first live tournaments, I worked with Keith Herschelin, the producer, who's an excellent producer. And he helped me with some basic rules, television rules, which I think a lot of people still break today, talking over the shot, for example, um, the hit. And, uh, and also Jim Kelly was the first host that I ever worked with. Jim had done just about every other game. So he taught me you know, things that you would think that are logical, like your cameraman. I mean, he's your best friend. And I'm like, well, I, I didn't understand it at first. You know, he told me how TV actually works. So along the way, I, I was uh, I, lucky that I ran into a lot of good people that helped point me in the right direction. Frank, I love asking players for, that that played during the time that you did. Now, Lowly's thirty years plus ago, and you you were talking about the era of, you know, Sandy Lyle and 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 Nick Faldo and company in Europe, the emergence, and that would include uh, Seve Ballesteros and uh, Ballesteros and and that as well. However, if you could, would you have traded places with today's players? 
if you could, instead of playing in the era in which you did compete against who you did play against, if you could play in today's era of golf, would you switch? Why or why not? Financially, the answer is easy. The, the, the answer is very easy. Of course you'd want to play now. I just saw the other day, was it Scotty Scheffler won $4 million at Bay Hill. I'm, not, I'm excluding the Players Championship here. And the very same week, there was an opposite tournament, Puerto Rico, where Bryce Garnett won. Bryce Garnett, the total prize money was $4 million. So Scotty wins, it's the same week, right? Scotty wins $4 million for first, and the total prize money at Puerto Rico is $4 million. So the game has changed dramatically. Tiger Woods had a huge impact on that. So from a financial point of view, then there's no question. Uh, I think I've, I'm on record. I think golf is right now for the sport and the audience. I think they're overpaid, massively overpaid. That, that's no disrespect. That's just if you consider apples for apples. But the generation that I played in, um, and especially the time that I had in Europe, you you learned a lot more. I, I think you were less naive, you were less mollycoddled, um, and and I think people had a better grasp of reality in the generation. And the generation prior to me would probably say the same thing as well. They'd probably say their generation had a better grasp of reality reality than what mine did. But I like the fact that there was a struggle. You really did know what $100 meant. And um, and now, you know, it's as soon as you win, you're flying privately. I know that's a generalization. Um, they are, the, the, they've taken it to the nth degree, hearing Jay Monahan the other day just saying, I look after 200 players. I'm like, no, Jay, you don't. You actually look after a lot more than that. You still look after the Champions Tour. You look after the Corn Ferry Tour. You are actually our custodian to the game. And I think we've lost, we've lost touch with that. The, the, the viewers are getting turned off because they hate this acrimony that we all know. I mean, the elephant in the room, right? Because they play the game. That's so important. So, you know, if Jay was also on the call, so no, Jay, you actually look after the game that everybody watches. And the fact that we can't agree with the USGA and the RNA when they want to change something, you know, there's an obligation. And I just think this generation has sort of forgotten part of that obligation at times. Do you think then, Frank, that the, that the game, at least at its highest competitive tiers, is it in a dangerous place? Oh, it's very much so. Hindsight's twenty twenty. It's we're in the same spot we really really were three years ago, and I know it's easy to say and it's and it's tough. But if Jay picked up the phone then, would we be in the same spot? The answer would be no. We if if it looked like the same spot, we'd be in it for a different reason, um, and and that's why you get paid the big bucks. I think for those decisions and in any company, and it's tough. It's very very hard. But you know the buck has to stop with somebody. So yeah, it is dangerous because we're not big enough. Um, the game is too slow. I know, and part of that is because the ball goes so far and they're, and they're trying to make the courses so hard. So, yeah, I feel for the guys. The green, um, but you know, these things out there where you know, it's like a five lane highway where we get five times you can obviously the, the motorway slows down. We're slowing down, but we're not a five lane highway. We're playing small fields every week. It, it, this, this year has had great stories. Sad viewer home doesn't know enough of the players that have broken through because normally that would happen at a slower pace. So that part's happening quickly. But the actual game, um, you know, I like all the innovations. I'm a tech freak myself, and whether it's Aimpoint Express or whatever, but, you know, if it takes 60 seconds and it takes more than that to hit a shot, right? If they played like people used to in years gone by, 40 seconds, right? You would be able to show a third more shots. That's a lot more. I know people want to see more shots, and I heard that the other day, just show more golf. It's not that hard because people take forever sometimes over a two-foot putt. I, I didn't think I was a speed merchant, but you know, relative to now, and I, and I think that's where you have to look at the product and you have to look at the people playing, and, and, and people do copy. The next generation is going to copy what they do, and you already see it. I see kids here at the lobby are doing the same thing. So we're passing on a slower version each generation. Um, if I watched basketball and they took a minute or two minutes, every free throw would go crazy. You really would. Or a penalty kick in soccer. Um, and that's what we're doing with our sports. So, yeah, I, I really do think we need a micro and a macro view of our game. And at the moment, it's just all about money and keeping top players here and all this and, and just sort of kicking the can down the road. Decisions have to be made and they have to be made, made quickly. And they haven't been. When you talk about the macro view, I, I'm gonna I want to take it out even a few more lens bumps because the game of golf, of course, is not only about 
the professional game, the, the touring professionals. Mm. The game is booming at what I call the 99.99% level, everybody yep. else. And yet at the professional side, you reference this fan fatigue. There, there's a dichotomy there. And, and I'm curious about mm. your, your comments about how the game is booming like it never has before on one side where the other side seems to be searching. Yeah, that's the, you've pinpointed the problem. I, I was at a birthday party last night. You know, we're always going to get a live question and, and whatever. And they're good people. They, they play golf. I live in a golf community. And they would rather go out and play. The golf that's played today is at an incredibly high level. I think it's as, as high as any level ever. So the standard of golf is incredible. But, but you're right, that's hard because all they hear about is all the, excuse the terminology, the crap that's going on in the game. But they love it. We, golf benefited, benefited from COVID more than any other sport because we were outdoor. And people did. They took up their clubs again. I mean, it's wonderful to be outside. You know, whether you believe in, in, in global warming or not, fresh air out there playing with your mates, whether you, you, know, you have a drink in one hand and play golf or you're very studious and serious about it, whether you play music or whatever. There's so many different ways for people to play recreational golf and so many different venues. It's a great way to travel. And then at the very top of that, obviously, are these amazing players that these people used to tune in and watch all the time. You know, I know from the TV point of view, I'm very proud, like of the CBS team, for example, of how hard they've, they've been working over the last few years to try and get the best product out there. But there's only so much you can do sometimes, but the low, it's low-hanging fruit, so people will always point the finger at commercials. Well, there's absorbent fees that have to be paid for a start to make sure that the players are playing for more money. So how can you pay an enormous amount of money for a broadcast and then have, and a lot of it goes into the prize money and then you've got to, you've got to have the commercials and the players play slowly. So, so you really have to look at the product sometimes honestly and say, well, what are we being given to show these people that want to see golf at the highest level rather than watch on TV and sort of wait two minutes to see one shot hit. They can go out in the range and hit 10 or 15 balls. We are, only a couple of weeks away, Frank Navalo, from the event that rises above all the noise with the Masters. You have, I'm sure, the, <laughs> the pleasure and the honor of being a part of that broadcast team with CBS. What are your thoughts heading into this Masters? What, what do you feel like are the big storylines coming in? To be part of that event, it's special when um, it is the usual rankings, everybody talks about world rankings now. And it's not that long ago, when that was not a criteria. So for a start to be invited, so if you're one of the compet you know, competitors that are playing in it, it's, it's huge. It's 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 something that you remember. You you always remember your first playing in the Masters, and you remember your last as well. And as a broadcaster, it's no different. There's an obligation to just do the best job you can. We have a team, I think, more than ready for that. Um, but then the other part of your question, I guess, to me, it's going to be the closest thing to what I remember three or four years ago, of just golf. Pretty much everybody that should be there is going to be there and we'll just do a golf tournament. And we will, as we sort of jokingly say in the industry, we'll crown a champion. And that'll be so refreshing to do that. Whether it's a Brooks Koepka or, you know, whether it's a John Rahm, Scotty Scheffler, Rory McIlroy, it doesn't matter. It's about a Masters champion. And, and I think that's going to be refreshing to people at home because that's the golf that they're all craving for. They don't want to hear about all the other stuff. They have their favorites, whatever tour they play on, and they'll be able to just see them compete. And, and we will see, hopefully, fingers crossed, yeah, the best golf we've seen all year because that, that conflict, um, is going to be sorted out, you know, on a, on a wonderful venue, whether it rains, hails, or shines. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it just being about the golf. Frank Nabilo finished fourth at the Masters back in 1996. Frank, you are an absolute legend. It is so much fun <laughs> to catch up with you, and I'm sure we could go on for hours, but I do appreciate the time that you've given us, and, and I very much look forward to you joining us again, if we may. Certainly, Matt. I know you got a busy day. Thanks for having on my, my, my thanks for having me on, my friend. Absolute delight. Uh, more of the Fairways of Life show, folks. When we come back, and we're going to hear from he who just won on the PGA Tour. Stay with us. Relax. 
Easy now. Find your happy place. It's all in the hips. Just tap it in. Yes! Find the latest clubs and apparel at Golf's Happy Place, the PGA Tour Superstore. In Ireland, golf is more than just a game. Come and experience our world-famous Lynx courses and our world-famous Parkland courses, all set alongside world-famous scenery. And visit our world-famous historic sites. And while you're here, enjoy our world-famous hospitality. Fill your heart with Ireland at ireland.com forward slash golf. It screams. It tracks. It's soft. It reacts. It is the Bridgestone Tour B with a game-changing reactive cover designed to spring faster off your driver and stick longer to your wedges. Try Bridgestone's Tour Bs. The Tour Ball reinvented. The Gen 6 Iron is a culmination of everything that we have learned as a team. The absolute best golf club I have ever hit. It's something special. Say hello to the new PXG Gen 6 Iron. The longest, most accurate irons we've ever made. They go higher and farther than any iron that I have hit to date, and they're so easy to hit. Super excited for the consumer to try this. They're going to love them. PXG, nobody makes golf clubs the way we do, period. Baseball? Nah. Football? Done it. I think I'm going to go after the PGA Tour. Bo, you're going to need the right equipment company. I think I got that. You know Tour Edge backs all their clubs with a lifetime warranty. I know. They ship all their premium custom clubs in 48 hours. I know. All their premium clubs are hand-built in the USA. I know. You know Tour Edge has won 35 times out here. Guys, I know. Pound for pound, nothing comes close. Boeing Golf provides the ultimate world-class golf destination with 10 championship-caliber courses spanning three resorts. Centered in Michigan's northern Lower Peninsula, the courses are the products of some of the game's masters, including Robert Trent Jones Sr., Arthur Hills, and Donald Ross. From the all-inclusive vacation packages, elite instruction with the Boeing Golf Academy, tournaments, and so much more, Boyne Golf truly offers an unrivaled Michigan golf vacation experience. Just log on to boynegolf.com. Zero Friction introduces the Wheel Pro Push Cart Golf Bag with its revolutionary three in one design, supportive legs that spring into action, a comfort grip handle with three locking positions, accessories for the modern golfer enhanced by seven pockets for more storage, and removable all terrain wheels which slide right into place. The new Zero Friction Wheel Pro Golf Bag checks every box for every golfer. Push, carry, or cart. The decision is yours thanks to Zero Friction. Head to zerofriction.com today. Welcome back to the Fairways of Life show, folks. Pleasure to have your company. Thank you to Frank Novolo for joining us this morning. He's amazing, isn't he? He's, I mean, it's no surprise that he's been doing television and doing it so brilliantly for so long because he's, like I said, he's such a deep thinker that he brings up fascinating subjects, things that certainly make you think, and that's what we were hoping we would accomplish in having uh, Frank on and catching up with him and finding out how things are going in his world. Well, in the world of Peter Malnati, I would say things could not be going better. Daniel Chopra and Earl Forsey were anchoring the coverage for PGA Tour Radio. Gents, what a finish. What a feel-good story. Matt, thanks. What a way to wrap up the Florida Swing, the always difficult Copperhead course at Ennisburg Resort for the Valspar Championship. Two-time winner in the PGA Tour Daniel Chopra was our analyst this week, and we saw Peter Malnati end a long victory route, first win since 2015 with an impressive back nine run of birdies to start and then one late birdie to be the difference maker. Malnati is a winner again on the PGA Tour. Daniel Chopra is just impressive on a day and a week where we know this course and the snake pit, everything bad that can happen down the stretch. A lot of good happened Sunday for Peter Malnati. Yeah, it really was extremely impressive considering the fact that 
Ball striking wise, he was average at best. He missed 25 fairways. He missed 25 greens for the week. He was third in putting. Wasn't even the best there, but his overall game was good enough. But I think the determining factor was the way he played the back nine. He shot a five under par 30 on the opening round on Thursday and then shot a 31 without any bogeys on Sunday when it really mattered. And he stole that tournament away from Cameron Young, who now gets his seventh career runner-up finish. Yeah, I want to talk about him. Another near miss for Cameron Young. At some point, that win is going to come. Not this week, though. And that is seven, like you said, runner-ups now for Cameron Young. How disappointing is this one, do you think? Well, I don't think he felt like he made any real major mistakes. Yes, he did bogey the last, but as it turned out, it didn't really matter. Malnati had a cushion there. So, again, it was one of those events in which Cameron Young, he didn't lose it. It had the tournament stolen from him by Malnati once again. And uh, he'd have to take some solace in that and just understand that one day it's all the chips will fall on my side of the fence. You played this tournament before, Daniel. You made seven appearances at the Valspar Championship. The way Malnati played that back nine and the snake pit all week, he was bogey-free in the, in the snake pit all four days, was three under for the week. How impressive is that the way you have to get it done at this tournament? Well, considering the fact that Malnati hasn't won much, he's only had one other victory on the PGA Tour, the way he played that back nine today, particularly around the snake pit, never missed a shot. Every single shot came out of the center of the club face. He shaped the ball beautifully on 16, the hardest hole on the golf course, faded it into the middle of the fairway, just played it beautifully, handled his emotions well when he had to take a ruling with the drop with the sprinkler heads and the rules official, handled it perfectly as well. It was just so impressive. It's like he's done this 20 times, not just his second victory. So something we brought up during our coverage, I mentioned you, Daniel Chopper. No one's played 17 better than you on the Copperhead course over the years since 2000. Six under in 24 rounds. You know who's tied for second now at 17 scoring on the Copperhead course? The guy that won the tournament, birdie 17 Sunday. Peter Malnati was two under this week at 17, five under. So he's knocking on your door, Daniel Chopper. Watch out. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, ribbing him about that one, although I'm sure his uh, check in the bank account will make him feel a little bit better. Another win for Malnati. Impressive second career win for him, and that wraps up the Florida Swing for 2024. Matt to the Lone Star State next for the Texas Children's Houston Open this week. Gents, thank you very much. Looking forward to your coverage of that week in and week out. You can hear PGA Tour Radio on the PGA Tour app or on PGATour.com or if you subscribe to National Satellite Radio. As to Peter Malnati, he captured that second PGA Tour victory at the age of 36 years, nine months, and 11 days. It was his 259th start on the PGA Tour. It does snap a winless streak that extended to 3,059 days or eight years, four months, and 16 days in total on the PGA Tour. He won the 2015 Sanderson Farms Championship. This was, get this, his eighth appearance at the Valspar Championship. He had missed six of his first seven cuts and his best finish prior had been a tie for 60th in 2019. This was his eighth start of the season. His previous best finish was tied for ninth at the Cognizant Classic in the Palm Beaches. His number 184 ranking in the official World Golf Rankings was the second highest by a Valspar Championship winner since 2008 when Kevin Streelman won uh, in 2013 at 205th. He earns his third top 15. This is an important stat. His third top 15 in his last five starts on tour, he previously had three top 15s in his previous 30 starts. So Peter Malnati has found something. Peter Malnati is definitely playing better. So let's hear from the winner, Peter Malnati, about how it came together for him at the Valspar. I, well, I'll say something in here I didn't say out there because I think it's important and relevant. Um, I... When my first, when my son Hatcher was born in um, 2019, I removed all my social media from my phone, so I don't do social media anymore, and I'm a happier person because of it. Um, not that it's bad; social media is not bad. But for me, I didn't use it particularly well because I would always read comments, um, and and I I wanted to use it as a way to be interactive, um, but it just it wasn't healthy for me. Um, so I removed it all. 
So I don't know specifically what is being said, um, you know, about me, about the PGA Tour, about uh, our sport in general, but I know the direction that it has been going for the last, last couple of years. And when I was outside, I was, I was compelled to say this. Um, I feel like this win, this win is, you know, first and foremost, it is it's for me. It's for my family. Um, it's for my caddy. It's for my team of people who support me. Um, but on a larger scale, it's also, it's for Tampa. It's for the Copperheads. It's for Valspar. And it's for all the events on the PGA Tour who find themselves in this new ecosystem kind of wondering where they fit and if they matter. Um, because I wanted, I said this out there because I wanted the Copperheads and the people of Tampa and the people from Valspar to know that there are thousands of Peter Malnati's out there who are 10 years old right now, teenagers right now, who dream of playing golf on the PGA Tour. And they want to have the moment that I just got to have. And if we don't have, you know, communities that believe in what the PGA Tour does and sponsors who support what the PGA Tour does, we don't have those moments. Um, and, you know, I know that the narrative turns a lot to, you know, we're coming up to Augusta, you know, we're preparing for the majors, we're in that season. And there, in terms of the actual people who participate in golf at the highest level, 90% of us dream of the moment that I just had. There's a 10% that really do probably gear their schedules and focus on the majors, but 90% of the people who have, you know, made it to the top level of professional golf and 100% of the people who dream of being at the top level of professional golf live for that moment that I just had. And it's amazing. I'm proud of myself. I did a lot of hard work. I'm proud of my family. They supported me. But it doesn't matter. All that hard work and everything, we don't have tournaments to plan if we don't have communities that think these tournaments matter. And if we don't have host organizations like the Copperheads and, you know, several other amazing host organizations around the country. Um, we don't have a PGA Tour. And so I just, this win is for, for all the host organizations, all the title sponsors, all the communities that kind of wonder, you know, what the meaning of their event is. Like, it's, it, it's to have entertainment come to your community, fulfill dreams for people like me, give the community something to be excited about in a way that gives back and enriches the community where we play. And I think this tournament is a shiny example of that. Um, and I'm just really, um, I couldn't be more proud and more honored to win, to win here, to win an event like this. And, you know, this is, stands out, it's special, it's amazing, but I just want, you know, all the events out there, like, I just want them to know, like, all, Every PGA Tour event, every Corn Ferry Tour event, every event on PGA Tour Americas matters because it matters to the community where you play. And we're going to make a difference. Um, and so anyway, I just, I, that, that was something I felt like I needed to say out there. And uh, I'm glad, I'm glad I was able to. Fascinating stuff from Peter Malnati, the newest winner. This is his second win on the PGA Tour. He, by virtue of his victory at the Valspar Championship, and considering the fact that he is in a leadership role amongst the players on the PGA Tour, remember he was part of those that just met with Yasser al uh last week in the Bahamas. It's pretty fascinating to hear his comments because it kind of defines the heart and soul of what he feels like he's doing and why he is doing it and how it applies to, well, everybody else that is either a fan or in some way contributes to what the PGA Tour does. Really, really fascinating insights. Little doubt about that. More of the Fairways of Life show, folks, coming up right after this. I guess, hello world, huh? <laughs> and with one subtle hello, Tiger began an amazing and unthinkable career. I've done it for 20 years now with, with Bridgestone. It allows me to play an aggressive style around the greens and it's allowed me to win a lot of tournaments. Bridgestone Golf, proud to be part of your journey. 
Boyne Golf provides the ultimate world-class golf destination with 10 championship caliber courses spanning three resorts. Centered in Michigan's northern lower peninsula, the courses are the products of some of the game's masters, including Robert Trent Jones Sr., Arthur Hills, and Donald Ross. From the all-inclusive vacation packages, elite instruction with the Boyne Golf Academy, tournaments, and so much more, Boyne Golf truly offers an unrivaled Michigan golf vacation experience. Just log on to boynegolf.com. I think when you're training for other sports or you're what why most people go to the gym is so that they can like have muscles and you know be strong and be healthy and a lot of the reason why they struggle to play golf is their body doesn't move properly for them to be able to hit a golf ball. And when you're training for golf it's a little bit different because you're focused more on flexibility and mobility and being uh, strong in motion. When you're able to kind of have a warm up and have a workout routine and kind of gradually build up to where you're training your body to move properly, yeah, you're going to get a lot of big dividends on the golf course. Easy now. Find your happy place. It's all in the hips. Just tap it in. Yes! Find the latest clubs and apparel at Golf's Happy Place, the PGA Tour Superstore. What if we started a company and the company was under no time constraints, no financial constraints? The one constraint is their clubs had to be exceptional performers and much better than any other alternative. I was told time and again, it'll never work. It worked like a house of fire. And I'll tell you what, I think our customers love it. BXG, nobody makes golf clubs the way we do, period. Stride by Zero Friction, the first of its kind personal caddy. Walk in comfort and style with Stride's remote and follow me technology. The Stride handles almost any terrain and its 54 hole range will last all day. The lightweight design and removable front wheels makes it simple to handle. Plus it easily fits golf carts. Order yours and save. Visit zerofriction.com backslash stride or scan the QR code to order yours today. Stride, your personal caddy. Welcome back to the Fairways of Life show, folks. Pleasure to have your company on this Monday. we got a big week planned for you. We're going to hear from Nelly Corda tomorrow. I want you to hear more from Peter Malnati because I think his comments are important for a whole variety of reasons for you to consider. Uh, we're also going to have a couple of major champions joining us over the next couple of days. Davis Love the Third, Tom Watson will be on the Fairways of Life show. I'm looking forward to catching up with them. Uh, Dom is back from his vacation. Dominic, to to watch Peter win, I mean, I know it hits differently for us because he's a friend of ours and has been for a long time. Do you actually remember when we first had him on the air? Because it was before his victory, so it was prior to 2015. But do you remember when oh, it, it was? was forever ago. I mean, we we I, we were talking to Peter in early into our radio days, if I recall. We did a series for many years called Beyond the Ropes where we had a player join us, men and women, several times over the period of a year when they're sort of starting their journey on the professional tours. And I think he was the very first person we did it with. Like, I, I wouldn't be shocked if we're talking about like 2012, 2013, 2014, something like that. It was a long, long, long time ago that um, we started spending time with Peter. And he is literally, if you ask most of the guys on tour, they, and you, you ask them to make a list of the nicest guys on tour, like the nicest. Peter almost universally is number one on everybody's list. <laughs> He's just that nice of a guy. So, yeah, it did hit different, I think, because we've known him for a long time. And, and um, I mean, I, yeah, Andrew's got that. That's a picture of Peter with my son from – my son was two in that picture at the Travelers Championship when I lived in Connecticut. And um, he's just that, – that joy on Peter's face, it's like always there at all times. So it couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. And it's really he, – he, it's so deserved, him and his team and everything. So uh, it's just fantastic. It was great to watch. It was, a, it was a pleasure. Yeah, he's an incredibly smart guy too, which is, which is something that I think – at times can almost get lost in the fact that he is such a, a wonderful human being to be around that P 
people don't realize that I see I always I have this theory that to play golf at its highest tiers, you need to be one of two things. You need either to be incredibly intelligent. And I would look to players who are very much, you know, use their intellect all the time. Jack Nicholas definitely did. Uh, Tiger Woods definitely did. If you look at someone that that's, you know, currently winning major championships, like a Brooks Kepka definitely does. Or you just have to pretty much just let everything come to you and, and operate on instinct. You know, just keep, keep, it, keep it blank. Uh, and and I, would, I would, there's a lot of places to go there. Modern players, more modern players, like a Dustin Johnson type of approach, just let it just water off a duck's back, you know, just, just let it roll. Uh, so Peter Malnati is a deep, deep thinker. And to think that he is one of the people who is in a leadership position for players on the PGA Tour, I actually see that as a good thing. I actually see him as a guy that can listen to both sides and take in some thoughts and make some good recommendations uh, accordingly. So as I mentioned to you, we're super excited about the next couple of days uh, before us because we've got some more major champions to give us some insights and to reflect upon their incredible careers and to share the experience with you guys, as well as hearing from Nelly, as well as, well as hearing more from Piero Malnati on the Fairways of Life show as we continue our march over the next few days on Tuesday and Wednesday. Looking forward to your company and until we are together again, folks, be well and goodbye for now.